and uh, of course, based on how That's you go fair. over there, you didn't do so well. No, no. no. On a personal note, I would also like to thank you for inviting a very good friend of mine, Leo Goldmarker, to be one of the other speakers here. I've known Leo since I was a graduate student. He was an undergraduate at Princeton. We have just hired him. We're very excited that he's coming to Williams. He skyped for his first interview, so I didn't get to see him. He visited the campus when I was out of town for another conference, so I'm very grateful to actually have a chance to see him after all these years again. Not grateful enough to stay for tomorrow and hear his talk, but <laughs> grateful to be So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about low-lying zeros of families of L functions and talk about where these are used, why we care about them, what kind of problems can you use, what are the big open questions, and some of these are going to lead to projects I'll be working on with students and postdocs this summer. I hope to start some other projects with people in the audience. So if there are things you want to know about, please let me know. I have been warned that I am no longer in the north, that things are a little bit slower paced here. I will not be going through all the slides and all the dots up there. Uh, but this is there so that if anybody is interested, I can talk to you very quickly about some of the other stuff. We'll just adjust the talk a little bit as we continue. Okay, so the first part of the talk is an introduction to the cat sarniak theory of low-lying zeros. And I've just finished a paper with some of my students from a couple of our years ago, and it's a really good write-up in the beginning just describing the general situation. Right. So here's a couple of problems where zeros of L functions play an important role. So uh, infinitude of primes, primes in arithmetic progression, Chebyshev's bias, how many times you know, up to x, your know, primes can go into 3 mod 4 versus 1 mod 4, the Birchings Winton Dyer conjecture, you know, if you have an elliptic curve, what is the geometric rank of the Model Bay group, uh, bounds for the class number. So there's a lot of problems that you can study in number theory where the answers, or at least the ways we have of solving them, are related to information about the zeros. So in particular, if you want to do things such as uh, the infinitude of primes or primes in arithmetic progression, this comes down to just understanding what's going on at the very edge of the critical strip. What's going on with the real part of s equals 1, that there are no zeros of the L functions there. If you want more refined things, such as you know, what is the error term, then you need a little bit more about the distribution of the zeros. This is where GOH comes into play. If you want even more, such as Chebyshev's bias, you know, the tendency of primes to congregate in certain residue classes, then you need the GSH, uh, the grand simplicity hypothesis, which essentially says if you have a family of L functions, think dear say L functions, the ordinates of the zeros are linearly independent over Q because, well, why not? So, you know, this is, of course, not the greatest you know, justification for such a conjecture. And in fact, if you look at function field analogs, GSH can fail in the function field case. But we do believe it holds for things like Kirchner L functions. The last is analytic rank uh, for you know, elliptic curves or the class number formula. And these are related to how often you have certain zeros of the Riemann zeta function very close to each other relative to the average spacing. I like to build myself as the last nuclear physicist to make the migration over to number theory. I have never taken an elementary number theory class. I have never taken an abstract algebra class. Uh, both of these will become very important later in the talk. I learned my number theory from a nuclear physicist. And he basically got sick and tired of only having about a thousand data points to work with. And when he heard, hey, you see the same behavior when you look at zeros of L functions, he became very excited. He started looking at L functions and he got me interested as well. And so the subject really began in the 1950s with the work of the nuclear physicists trying to understand the behavior of heavy uh, nuclei like uranium. And so classically, the three-body problem is intractable. Uh, in academia, the two-body problem is just barely tractable. But definitely in uh, <laughs> physics, once you get to three bodies in general configuration of the plane, we don't have a way to write down an analytic solution. So imagine uranium with over 200 protons and neutrons and a far more complicated force of interaction. Well, it turns out that this actually helps us because it's so complicated. How does it help us? Well, the idea is we give up trying to write down exactly what's going on and instead try to figure out approximately what's going on. We consider a lot of related sensors. So quantum mechanics reduces to the following linear algebra problem. You have some matrix H, the Hamiltonian, Cn are the energy eigenstates, and En are the energy eigenvalues. And so the only reason I don't do this in my linear algebra course is that H is infinite by infinite and we don't know any of the entries. And so it's pretty hard to diagonalize a matrix where you, know, you need at least some information if you're going to make progress. But the interaction is so complicated, you know, we have no chance. Now numerically, there are things we can do. We can shoot neutrons into the energy and into the uranium atom and just see what comes out and use that to get some idea of the internal structure. But if we want to try to solve this equation, the interactions are so complicated that we can't just write down the Hamiltonian. So Wigner's great insight was to go back to statistical mechanics and give up on writing down the actual Hamiltonian for our system 
and consider a bunch of similar systems. So for instance, if you want to calculate a quantity like pressure, let's take the simple case when all molecules move either left or right at the same speed, and I just want to see how many molecules hit a given wall in a given amount of time. Well, for each configuration of molecules in the room, I can calculate what that quantity would be, and then I can average over all configurations. And then the hope is, you know, you cross your fingers, click your heels through together, you know, uh, you know, something like that. Most systems will be close to the system average. And if that's the case, the system average is often very easy to calculate and gives you a really good idea of what's going on for the specific system you care about. Depending on what your system has, that will restrict what kind of matrices you look at. So different physical properties will tell you your matrix should be real symmetrics, complex emission, unitary, whatever. So a little bit more formally, let's say we have a physical system that's supposed to be real symmetric. So I have my real symmetric matrix, I have my upper triangular matrices which I choose independently. And then we can put a probability on the space of matrices as follows. So the probability of a matrix A is just the product of the probability of the independent entries. Or a little bit more formally, the probability I choose a matrix where my entries are in some interval is just the product of the integrals over that. If you're a physicist, this is perfectly fine. But there is one small issue. Now, it's not as much of an issue because of work in the last few years. What probability distribution P do we choose for the matrix elements? Uh, it's natural to choose P essentially to be a Gaussian, because if you think about it, what really matters is not the matrix, but the eigenvalues of the matrix. And whenever we have a transformation, whenever we write it down in a matrix form, we have to choose a base. So your transformation, your matrix should be invariant under a change of basis. And so if you put in this kind of orthogonal or unitary invariance, it's actually going to force P to be a Gaussian. That said, you can use whatever P you want, as long as P has finite moments, the theory is very well defined. It was only in the past few years that people were able to show that it doesn't really matter what P you take, all the quantities will essentially be the same in the limit. From a number theory point of view, uh, this model was very influential in the very early days of the subject, not so much now. Nowadays, people look at classical compact groups, and the reason they do it is uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities with the function field case and monodromy, but also, there's a very canonical sense of how you choose a matrix at random from a classical compact group. You use Hamish. And so for number theory today, these matrices are not used as much, but from a historical perspective, it's nice to just see where the subjects came from. Right, so what I want to do now is talk a little bit about some of the statistics one can look at. So the first statistic is the n-level correlation. If you want, think of just the pair-level correlation. So I take my events, they can be eigenvalues, they can be energy levels, spacings between primes, and I look at how often the difference lies in the given box. If you're an analytic number theorist, instead of looking at a box which has sharp cutoffs, you would do some kind of smooth counting, and you, know, you would get a statistic that's very nice. And so Odlisco looked at the spacings between adjacent zeros of the Riemann zeta function. This is very similar to looking at the correlations. If you understand the correlations <coughs> for all n, you can use this to get the spacing measure. And what he noticed was phenomenal agreement between the spacings of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and what you get when you look at large unitary matrices. And this was building on earlier observations of Montgomery and Dyson when, you know, Montgomery, I think it's a very famous story, but I think it is still required that it has to be told every time you give this talk. When he was a graduate student, he went to the Institute for Advanced Study. He was talking to the great Freeman Dyson who asked him, what are you looking at? And Montgomery said, I'm looking at the correlation of the Riemann zeta zeros. I look at the pair correlation and I'm seeing the following. And as he goes, really, you, this is what we see in random matrix theory. And so this began, the subject it began, the physicists and the mathematicians talking to each other. There's a whole bunch of statistics you can study now, a whole lot of similarities you can see between the two different fields. What's nice is the calculations are often very different. The techniques you use on the number theory side are very different than the techniques you use on the physics side, more than just actually doing calculations rigorously. And it allows you to have an independent way of checking what your answer should be. It's very nice when you have two different methods that lead to the same answer. So here's a bunch of statistics people can look at. So as I said, instead of a box, you can use a smooth test function, you can look at spacing statistics, you know, how long do you have to wait, you see the same answer between these, you know, uh, complex emission matrices and zeros of the Riemann zeta function. You can look at the co uh, peer correlation and also the triple correlation. So one of the big heartaches in the subject is trying to figure out combinatorially what is the tractable object to study. And so it took a while, uh, almost 20 years from the work of Montgomery, before the three-level or triple correlation was done for the Riemann zeta function. Hedgehog's paper is unfortunately 
uh, forgotten a little bit because right around the same time, Rudnick and Sarnak handled not just the triple correlation, but the n-level correlation, and not just for the Riemann zeta function, but for all cuspidal automorphic representations. Uh, one of them told me it took them six months, one of them told me it took nine months to figure out combinatorially what was the tractable object to look at to be able to do the calculations and do the comparisons with the random matrix theory. So at this point, it's looking like these complex Hermitian matrices, where we choose a probability, choose the entries, it's looking like this is a great way to calculate things for number theory. Unfortunately, this can't be the whole story. And there are two things that give us, you know, pause that, you know, something more needs to be done. The first is, not only do we see the same behavior for these complex emission matrices, but we also see it when we look at the behavior of eigenvalues of the classical compact groups. So when you say the zeros of the Riemann zeta function look like complex emission matrices, you could also say they look like the eigenvalues of these classical compact groups. The other, and which is more important because this is a number theory conference, is that this is insensitive to finitely many zeros. If I throw in a few zeros or throw away a few zeros, it's not going to affect the limiting behavior of the correlations or the spacings between zeros. And as a number theorist, there are a couple of zeros we really care about, the zeros near the central point. And so all of these statistics are insensitive to what's going on there. So this is telling us that we need another statistic, we need another way of looking at what's going on. And so the statistic I want to talk about today for the most part is the n-level correlation. So I have some L function, LSF. QF is going to be the analytic conduct. It's, going to, it's logarithm is going to tell me how to renormalize the zeros near the central point so that I have mean spacing 1. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some Schwartz functions and I'm going to sum you know, my scaled values of the zeros. And this will be the n-level density. It turns out for technical reasons, the best way to do this is to put on some kind of restriction here that ji is not plus or minus jk. It just leads to a combinatorial object that is better for comparisons with the random matrix theory. By inclusion exclusion, it's not that bad to you know, put this in or remove it. It's just what leads to a nice expression at the end of the day. Unlike the n-level correlations or the spacings between zeros, this is a much better statistic if you like elliptic curves. Because now individual zeros contribute in the limit, and in fact, the zeros that contribute most are the ones near the central point. The further you go away, since we're rescaling so that these have mean spacing 1, the less contribution we get. Now unfortunately, while this is good for us, it's also bad for us. If you look at the Riemann zeta function, if you go high up on the critical line, there are more than enough zeros to look at. The spacings between zeros is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. In a small bounded interval, you will have more than enough zeros and you can do some averaging. For one specific L function near the central point, you only have a small number of zeros, and thus you've lost the ability to do some averaging. So what do we do? Well, we go back to what we were doing in random matrix theory. We took a bunch of matrices chosen from some kind of ensemble with some kind of probability on the space. So the analog here is we look at families of L functions. Uh, every time I give the talk, I say, you know, the definition of a family is pending. It should come soon in the next year or so. I have been saying this for about a decade now, but I'm getting more optimistic that we are close to a definition of a family. Right now, it's more the, you'll know it when you see it. So a family of L functions, think of family of Dirichlet characters. Maybe they all have the same conductor. Maybe they're all quadratic characters. Think of cuspidal uh, new forms, maybe of a given level and weight. Think mass forms. Think, you know, forms on GL3. Things like this would be nice examples of families. A bad example of a family would be cusp forms whose first zero is twice the average spacing from the central point. A restriction like this is not a natural one. Another good example would be families of elliptic curves, you know, one parameter families of elliptic curves. So these are examples where we can actually do the averaging. And so the idea is, when we look at this density, we're going to use the explicit formula to relate sums over zeros to sums over the coefficients. And then we need some kind of formula in the family, some kind of trace formula to actually execute these sums. And the notion of a family has to be rich enough that we have some kind of averaging that can be done with it. All right. So just to quickly go through how we do this, I was actually having a talk with you know, somebody recently about, you know, should every undergraduate be required to know complex analysis? And if you're going to continue in mathematics, absolutely. And so let me just give you a quick sense as to how you do these calculations. So we start with the Riemann zeta function. And of course, in complex analysis, we're taught whenever you see something, you take the logarithmic derivative and you do a contour interval. But what's really nice is we have two ways of writing the zeta function. One is as a sum, and the other is as a product. And so when we have a product, the product is ideally suited to taking the logarithm. And when we take the logarithm, we then differentiate, we expand using the geometric series formula, we have some good part which is easy to control, 
and then some other part over here. And so now if I do a contour integral, I have a lot of different choices of what test function do I want to hit it with. If I hit it with x to the s over s, if I shift the contour now, every time I get a zero or a pole, I'm going to get a contribution. The main term is going to come from the pole of the zeta function at 1. The negative sign reinforces the minus from the pole. I'll get an x. And then if the Riemann hypothesis is true, all the other contributions will be of size x to the 1 half. On this side, I have my detective function. If p is less than x, the integral is 1. If p is greater than x, the integral is 0. Well, instead of using you know, this very simple test function, I could put in a Schwartz function. And now if I integrate over here, I'm going to be getting my Schwartz function evaluated at zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Well, this is very similar to the statistic we were just talking about, the end level density. What about on this side? So now I have the integral of phi of s, p to the minus s. Well, I can write the prime as, you know, e to the something. And you see that you get a Fourier transform coming out over here. And so we expect to relate zeros on one side at the test function to sums of coefficients of the Fourier transform on the other side. And this allows us to convert knowledge of zeros to knowledge of coefficients. If you want to think back to linear algebra to the eigenvalue trace law, which relates uh, powers of the eigenvalues to the matrix coefficients. And the idea is if we're choosing a matrix at random, it's the matrix coefficients we know, and we want to pass from knowledge of the matrix coefficient to knowledge of the eigenvalues. It's the same thing over here. We have some information about the coefficients of the L functions, we're going to use this to pass the information about the zeros of the L function. Alright, so the cat sinic density conjecture is the following. I take some nice family of L functions, I average over them, if you want you can put in some weights, that as n goes to infinity, so think of it as the conductors, think of it as some way of weighting which ones you're looking at, this should converge to what I would get if I look at the eigenvalues of some classical compact group. And so, on the function field side, we actually have very good results, we have a way of detecting what the correspondence should be, it's through the monodromy group. On the number theory side, it's a lot harder to identify what the symmetry group is, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few moments. And so again, you're very explicitly, the conjecture is the scale distribution of zeros near the central point agrees with the scale distribution of eigenvalues near one of a classical compact group. Which classical compact group? You know, that's the interesting question. There are five main flavors, unitary, symplectic, and then three orthogonals, so even, so odd, and then essentially a combination of so even, so odd. The problem is the orthogonal flavors are indistinguishable if the support of my test function is between minus one and one. So you could be in the ridiculous situation where you have a family of L functions, they all have even functional equation, but the corresponding symmetry is S O R. And so the ways around this are to either extend the support, which is extremely difficult for a lot of families, or to look at the two or high level densities. And the two level density is sufficient to distinguish between the two candidates for arbitrarily small support. Alright, so the main data for later in the talk is going to be testing these random matrix theory conjectures. So, one of the things I've been you know, interested in for years is family of elliptic curves with rank at the central point. So, we can construct families with high model of A rank. And it's conjectured that this should correspond to L functions that have lots of zeros at the central point. And so, you know, can we actually see this when we do the n-level densities? And if so, how do these zeros affect the other nearby zeros? So, in the limit, um, you know, we understand what's going on, but for finite values of conductors, the subject is still somewhat open. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some recent progress there. Whatever theory we have has to explain two interesting phenomena. The first is the excess rank phenomena. That in many families of elliptic curves, we were observing numerically a lot more zeros at the central point than was predicted by minimalist theories. And the second is that the first zero above the central point seems to be repelled. And the more zeros we have, the more it seems to be repelled. It even seems to be repelled when there are no zeros at the central point. And so later I'll go through a lot of this detail in a much greater... Uh, okay. So I want to just end with a conversion table. I'm hoping that my Boston accent is not too hard to understand here, but my physics accent might be a little bit harder. And so I thought I would just give you a little way to figure out, when I speak physics, what I really mean. So again, this is because I was trained by a nuclear physicist. So as a number theorist, we study zeros. Physicists study energy levels. How do physicists study energy levels? They take neutrons, they're really good at smashing things, and they smash these neutrons into the heavy nuclei, and they see what comes up. Well, we don't have expensive equipment like that. Uh, we barely have enough money to buy, I guess, name tags. But uh, we do have Schwartz test functions, and these are publicly available. 
<laughs> and so we can take a Schwartz test function, we can shoot it in at the zeros, and we can see what comes out. Now the physicists, they have this big expensive grants and this big expensive equipment they have, they can only shoot in neutrons of given energy levels. If they could shoot in an arbitrary neutron, they could understand exactly what's going on, but they can't. As much as we want to make fun of them, and we can do that blah, 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 we have similar restrictions as well. It's the support of our Schwartz test function. Ideally, we would be able to shoot in any test function, and then we could understand completely what's going on. So for instance, I'd love to shoot in the Dirac delta functional. And then I would know exactly what's going on at the central point. I would prove Birch went to Dyer, we would have a million dollars. Unfortunately, the support of the Dirac delta functional, its Fourier transform, is the function that's identically one, which would mean we would have to understand the prime sums everywhere. And so we have technological limitations as well, and this goes back and forth between the two. All right. I want to now shift gears and talk about you know, results for elliptic curves. Uh, my feel, uh, how long do I have? So, a while. No, no. Um, Till 10.30. Till 10.30, right. Yeah. And so that is not enough time to go through all the different conjectures. No matter what you said I was going to say, it's not enough. Yeah. And so I'm going to just skip all the conjectures that we make. Okay, all the conjectures there. So if anybody wants to, the conjectures that they want on the slides, assume standard conjectures about elliptic curves and what follows. In some cases, these are now theorems. And so what I want to do is I want to study one parameter families of elliptic curves. So I have some polynomials with integer coefficients. <coughs> it's unfortunate notation. But I'm going to define AEP to be the sum of the coefficients ATP that's different than the defining polynomials here. So the ATP essentially counts how many solutions we have mod P to an equation like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the average. Now what's nice about a quantity like this is we only need to calculate it in a window of length P because if I increase <coughs> any of these values of T by P, well, since I'm counting the number of solutions mod P, and these are all integer polynomials, that's not going to change any of the counting. So it's enough to understand these values in one complete period, in one complete cycle. The ones that really matter is the sum of the, is the average first moment and the average second moment. So I can replace this with squares. The higher moments turn out not to really matter. Okay. And so the main result, uh, going back to my thesis, is uh, that there is an agreement between number theory and random matrix theory. Now, what inputs do we need to prove that? In addition to the standard conjectures, one of the big ones is an input on what these average moments are. And so this is known in some cases by work of Rosen and Silverman, and I'll actually be talking to Silverman about this tomorrow. Um, imagine these AEPs were constant. If the AEPs are constant, let's say it's equal to negative 5, you would just pull it outside the sum, and then this is just the prime number theorem. So there are families where this is constant, it's very easy to calculate. What Rosen and Silverman were able to show is that if you have a rational surface, and the technical restriction of what a rational surface is down below, then this sum is equal to the rank of the elliptic surface over Q of T. So it will give me the rank of the Model Bay group for the family. There are some families where we can calculate this explicitly, and if anybody is interested, um, Right over here in this appendix, I actually show how you can write down certain families of elliptic curves, evaluate the Legendre sums exactly, and construct families that have given rank without actually checking the height matrix. And I'm going to try to push this a little bit further over number fields with some students in the summer. All right, so the main result is that for one parameter families for suitably small support, uh, I was able to show that the one and the two level densities agree with what you would get from random matrix theory. And it looks like you have this extra term here, which is just the number of zeros at the central point. So in the limit, these extra family zeros appear to be independent of the other zeros. So if you try to think what's going on on the random matrix theory side, you have your random matrix, and then you have an R by R, I apologize for the accent, you have an R by R diagonal identity matrix in the upper corner, which does not interact at all with the rest of the matrices in the scaling limit. But for finite conductors, it's not clear at all what happens. Okay, so since Tom said I'm allowed to babble until he said 1035, yeah. uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how you would identify the symmetries, how the saddle tank distributions come into play, and then I will go back and see what the consequences of this are for families of elliptic curves. And so a lot of this is joint work with Eduardo Duenas, and so here's a bunch of families where we can identify the underlying symmetry. And again, what this means is we can calculate the statistics, and in the range we calculate them on the number theory side, they agree with something on the random matrix theory side. So how do we do the calculations? Well, there's three main ingredients. 
The first is control of the conductors. Usually the conductors are monotone or constant. If they're constant, you can pass the summation through the, through the test function, the summation on the family, to the Fourier coefficients, and then things become very easy. If the conductors vary even small amounts on a logarithmic scale, the calculations become very difficult. But you know, they can be controlled through sipping. The next is an explicit formula which we talked about, which relates sums over zeros to sums of the coefficients, relates the Fourier transform to the original function. And the last is all of this would be useless if we didn't have a good trace formula. And this is where the theory on GLN is being held up right now. Uh, only recently have we been able to get good families on GL3. So uh, Shin and Templier have done some great work, uh, Goldfeld and Kontorovich have done some great work, but for the most part it's still a GL1, GL2 family and fun things I can do to GL1, GL2 things to make things on GLN that are really not on GLN. And so you know, you can take symmetric powers, that's fine, you can take rank and convolutions, that's fine, but you know, a generic GLN family, it's still a little bit of ways because of the trace formulas. We don't have good ways to average. One application of stuff like this is to estimate order vanishing at the central point. So the higher end you can calculate for the end level density, the better results you can get on order vanishing at the central point. The problem is the bounds you get depend on the end you're looking at, and the coefficient becomes larger the higher end you look at. So you get a better decay rate. You get a decay rate of you know, the probability of seeing things of rank at least r is decaying like r to the minus n. So the greater n you take, the better. But unfortunately, the coefficient here is growing. So you get some strange results such as, at most, 250% of the forms vanish to rank 3 or more. Which is you know, not really an impressive <coughs> statistic to be able to compute. So one of the things I'm hoping on you know, finishing up uh, this summer is some work with some students where we're increasing the support and doing a bunch of things to finally get this constant C to be small enough that we can actually get a benefit from looking at these high level densities. Okay, so identifying the symmetry type. So I said if you have a function field situation, you can often get the symmetry type through the monodromy group. In the number field case, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a lot harder. And in fact, for a while, people thought that the theory of these low-lying zeros was essentially a theory of the signs of the functional equation. So, for instance, imagine you have all even signs. There are two possibilities. It's either symplectic or it's SO-even. And the thought was, well, it's SO-even <coughs> if you have a corresponding family with odd signs that you're just forgetting about. And if there's no such corresponding family, then it's symplectic. It turns out this is not the case. And uh, Peter Sinek, David Eduardo, and myself were both his students, a good family to look at on GL4 and GL6, where we were able to show that this is not the case. Where there was no corresponding family of odd forms, but it was actually SO even and not symplectic. So the theory is a little bit more than just the theory of the distribution of signs. And so what I want to try to do for the next few minutes is give you an idea of how you would identify the symmetries in some cases. So, general framework, pi is a cuspal automorphic representation of GLN. Uh, I have some analytic conductor. I have some series expansion. GOH is true, proof pending. We can write the zeros as 1 half plus i gamma j. Fortunately for what we're doing, we don't need the uh, GRH. All we need for GRH is for interpretive purposes. If GRH is true, all the zeros lie on the critical line. We can talk about spacings between zeros. If GRH is false and the zeros are in the critical strip, we can't order the zeros anymore, and we lose the direct comparison to nuclear physics to random matrix theory. But that's fine, we can still compute these statistics anyway, we just don't have the same interpretation. We have the stacking parameters. So we can write our lambda pi of p to the nu as the sum of the nth power. So this is essentially the nth moment of the Satake parameters. We have an Euler product, so I can write my L function not only as a sum, but as a product of n terms of the following form. And now the explicit formula, the sum of my test function at the weighted zeros, I get some nice term here, and I get a sums over primes and prime powers of something like this. If the Ramanujan conjectures are true, and you know, we have proofs of that in some cases, in other situations we have bounds towards Ramanujan, you quickly see that when nu equals 3 or higher, you don't have to worry about these terms. And the reason is you're dividing by p to the 3 halves, as long as this isn't too large, you're going to have convergence. And only the first and the second terms are going to matter. And this is going to give us a good sense of the universality. One of the versions of the title I gave to Tom was on you know, low, was subtle tape, low order terms. This is where something like this is going to come into play, is the distribution of these numbers as I vary the family of L functions that I look at. Different families will have different distributions. And there's been some very impressive work 
uh, recently about what kind of distributions these parameters can have. But their first and the second moments seem to be constrained to a very small number of cases. And that's responsible for this great universality. Uh, Eduardo Duenas in his thesis looked at symmetric spaces and looked at other possibilities for low-lying zeros. None of these seem to arise in number theory, but there are other distributions that could have come into play. And the reason they don't is because of the universality of the first and the second moment of these functions. All right, so just rewriting things, lambda, you know, Peter the new is the nth moment. Uh, the two main terms I care about are the first and the second moment. In every family we've looked at except for elliptic curves, the first moment is just zero. And so, of course, this is one of the reasons why we want to look at families of elliptic curves. It's the only family we really can work, you know, get our hands on, where this is not zero. And then we have the second moment over here. And so the corresponding classical compact group is if this sum is zero, we get unitary. If the sum is one, we get symplectic. If this sum is minus one, we get uh, orthogonal. And so let's just define this constant CF to be you know, the second moment sum. It'll be zero, one, minus one if it's unitary, symplectic, orthogonal. And so you know, here it is again. Here's our symmetry constant. What we can do is we can take the rankin silva convolution of two families. So you know, this should have been done a lot earlier in the theory of the subject. Imagine you have two families of L functions where you know their symmetry type. You can take the rankin silva convolution and build a compound family. What's the symmetry of the compound? Well, what's really nice is the Satake parameters of the convolution are just the product of the Satake parameters. And so in addition to never having taken a number theory course, I never took a group theory course, but I did learn enough group theory to understand you know, groups of order two, um, groups of order three, you know, fields of order, you know, stuff like this. That's in the realm I can do. And so the following theorem is, you know, if you have two nice families of L functions, then the symmetry of the convolution is the product of the symmetries. And the proof is at the level of, you know, somebody who doesn't understand group theory. Uh, I have a sum over the Satake parameters to get my moments. Well, because the Satake parameters factor as the product, the sum just splits. And so I just multiply my symmetry constants. And that's what determines. So then the question, yes? Sorry, Steve. Uh, on the previous slide, the yes. corresponding groups, I actually one more slide back. Okay. Um, is that a theorem at the bottom? That the, so, or is it just empirical? That the, uh, those are the if, corresponding groups. If this sum equals 0, 1, or minus 1, it corresponds with unitary, symplectic, or orthogonal. That's a theorem. And that's a theorem. It's a theorem just because when you actually do the calculation and you plug this in, if you plug in a 1 here, you now use the prime number theorem to evaluate this sum. And it will then agree with the symplectic. Oh, so, okay. Yes. Right. So, so it's simple, simple enough that you can actually calculate the thing. Yes. Yes. Basically, it's just the prime number theorem. And so because the rankin silva convolution is the product of the Satake parameters, we just get the symmetries coming in, and then we can use the prime number theorem exactly as before. So this is very similar to the central limit theorem. So in the central limit theorem, you have incredible universality of behavior. You know, it doesn't seem to matter what distributions you start with. You know, as long as you have finite moments, you can adjust to have mean zero variance one. When you keep independently sampling, your sample converges to be normally distributed. So where does the distribution live? The distribution lives in the lower order terms in the rate of convergence. And so the higher moments of your initial distribution affect how quickly normality settles in. And it's the same thing that goes on over here. In a lot of what we're doing, it's these lower order terms that affect how quickly we converge to this limiting behavior. And this is where there's now a lot of opportunity for new work to be done. You know, especially in some of these higher families where we have more interesting, more exotic distributions for these uh, Sato Tate laws. So again, the difficulty is trying to see the arithmetic. To me, it's a little bit sad that you don't see any of this in the main term. That if I take families of elliptic curves with uh, torsion group this or torsion group that, I don't really see the difference at all in the main terms. If I take different number fields, I don't see the difference in the main terms. All the arithmetic lives in the lower order terms. And so if you want to try to break this universality, break the symmetry, you've got to go to the low order terms, you've got to go to the rates of convergence. And that's where, you know, I think the next you know, big results are going to start to come into play. Okay. So what I want to do now for the last part of the talk is talk about some of the numerical data and how this has led us to what we believe is the right theory for finite conductors to describe what's going on and talk a little bit about some open problems that I hope to interest people in looking at in the near future. And this is joint with Eduardo Duenas and the gang from Bristol, which is mostly uh, John Keating and Ian Snape, and a grad student we share to Kim Huang. Okay, so because it's been at least five minutes, I thought I would just remind you of the results from earlier. You know, in my thesis, I looked at the n-level density of elliptic curves, 
I saw agreement with number theory, I'm sorry, with random matrix theory, and there's this extra term over here, which is related to the geometric rank. And again, if Butch wanted to die, it was true, if you know, you should get a term like this. So you can look at this as providing support for the Birch Swinton dial, but unfortunately, due to the support of our you know, test function, it's not a theorem. You, know, you can't use this to prove Birch Swinton dial. You would have to take the Dirac Delta functional, which is well beyond what we can compute. But that's it. It's nice to see a term like this arising. And then it leads to the natural question well, these curves are acting as if they have R zeros at the central point. What do those zeros do to the zeros nearby? How do they affect? How do they influence? So let's look at some results. So I'm going to look at, uh, right now, a little bit more general, and then I'll specialize to some families in a bit. So there was a general conjecture that says if you have a nice family of elliptic curves of rank R, then half the time the rank will be even, half the time the rank will be odd. And if your elliptic curve family is nice, this is actually a theorem. Uh, it depends sometimes on square for receive or ABC conjecture. But if things are nice, you can prove a generic family will have this property. And when you do the numerics, we really did see about half the time even rank, half the time rank odd. The next conjecture people had was a minimality conjecture, that the rank is as small as it can be, subject to the parity being 50-50. And so what that means is if you have a family of rank R, you would expect in the limit, half the curves would be rank R, half the curves would be rank R plus 1. For odd rank above the family rank, this is actually very good. And in most families we looked at, you know, we saw about 48% of the time the rank was R plus 1, only about 2% of the time was it R plus 3 or higher. However, for rank R and R plus 2, the results were very bad. Uh, in most families that were looked at, about 32% of the time it was rank R, and about 18% it was rank R plus 2. And this was very stable, it didn't really seem to matter how people looked at families of elliptic curves. So there's lots of great results by people looking at quadratic twists, looking at all elliptic curves, looking at one parameter families of elliptic curves, Everything, looking at elliptic curves with prime conductor, everything people looked at, they seem to just see this huge excess of curves here. And so the problem is, maybe this is small data sets. And so even though we're looking at millions of elliptic curves, you know, with conductors around you know, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 20 and higher, really the convergence is on a log scale. And so I, I like to give the following example about you know, the dangers of conjecturing on small data. So I believe 40% of all into yes. Sorry, I see. Um, I'm a little behind you. So okay. um, when you say rank, uh, the rank of the family is R. So 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 this is over Q of t. So I take a one parameter family of elliptic curves, yeah. and I calculate the Model Bay group over Q of t. Yeah. And so there are uh, R points that will you know be on it. And so when I specialize for all t sufficiently large, each specialized elliptic curve will have at least R linearly independent. And then it turns out that when you specialize, uh, you have far more that are rank R plus 2 than you would have expected. And when you specialize about 18% of the time in the ranges we're looking at, you're still seeing rank R plus 2. And it was believed that that should be going down to 0. Over here, for R plus 3 and higher, it was going down to 0. So here is you know, the bad conjecture. You never make conjectures like this before tenure. 20% uh, <laughs> of all integers are prime, and 20% of all integers start at twin prime pair. And so, you know, I have my conjecture, I calculate it in the interval 1 to 10, it looks good, and I even doubled my range up to 20, the conjecture is still solid, you know, there's no need to do further computations and, you know, slow down the service at Williams, you know, this conjecture is clearly true. Okay. Uh, you know, fortunately, as I said, I have been tenured now, so I am like, but, um, Leo, be careful. Um, the difficulty, of course, is you would never make a conjecture like this about primes because you're only counting up to 20. This is not nearly far enough to see the limiting behavior. For the elliptic curves, even if we're looking at curves whose conductors are of size 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 20, even if we're looking at millions of events, on a logarithmic scale, 10 to the 14 is very small. And so just because we would never make conjectures on primes, we should never make conjectures on elliptic curves with such a paucity of data. And so you know, even though I'm, we're getting very convincing data like this, I don't believe this data is truly indicative of what happens because we haven't gone far enough. And in fact, a couple of years ago, Mark Watkins finally looked at a specific family, and he was able to go far enough to see the 18% significantly decrease. But you know, for the most part, we're not able to go far enough to see this decrease happening. Uh, so here's you know, some families, you know, the coefficients go from 0 to 10, seeing around 20%, 21% here. 
He has a specific one parameter family. I'm looking at 2,000 consecutive curves starting at different t-values. Uh, I'm not going to claim that it's starting to decrease going from 13.9 to 13.8. The numbers are fluctuating around. Uh, these calculations were done about 10 years ago. You, know, you can do much better now. But you know, again, it takes a while before you really start to see things decreasing. Here's what the first eigenvalue above 1 should look like for SO even matrices. So again, for SO even matrices, nothing forces you to have an eigenvalue at 1. And so when you look at the probability distribution, the most likely account, outcome is to have an eigenvalue close to 1. For SO odd matrices, you have to have an eigenvalue at 1. And so the first eigenvalue after that seems to be repelled. And the probability is a little bit shifted. So if we look at families of elliptic curves, here's 209 rank 0 curves from a bunch of families. And we see that this looks much more like SOR than SO even, even though these curves don't have any zeros at the central point. You know, the mean median is about 1.35. If I increase the conductor, you, know, you can see noticeable de oh, I guess the value just died. Okay. You can see noticeable decrease in the repulsion as the conductor increases. Uh, the next thing is this is looking at rank two curves. This is the most you know, BS slides I ever post. There's only 35 data points here. But the problem is because the conductors are growing so rapidly. The log of the conductor is already 16.1, going up to 23.3, which takes you know, a bit of time. Only 34 data points. Well, you can see it is noticeably decreasing again. So one of the results we get from our numerical experiments is as you increase the conductor, the repulsion seems to decrease. So whatever model we come up with has to take that into account. The next interesting thing I noticed when I was you know, doing these calculations years ago is uh, as long as the computer is calculating, why not calculate a bunch of things? One of the things I had to calculate was not just the first zero, but the first couple of zeros, and the relative spacings between the zeros. And you know, when I saw this, this was very shocking. It seems like the relative spacings between zeros does not depend on what's going on. All the zeros, it's like they're glued together, and they're all just picked up. And so if you look at it, the spacings between the, the second and the first, the third and the second, the third and the first, it doesn't seem to matter how things are done. Rank zero curves, rank two curves, I'm seeing the same things. You know, t tests everything is significant. Uh, rank two curves, rank four curves, again, seeing the same values. Rank two curves and rank two curves. These are rank two curves coming from rank zero families. These are rank two curves coming from rank two families. Again, the repulsion all seems to be the same. So this was very surprising. It seems like the more zeros you have at the central point, the more it repels, but the repulsion seems to be shared equally among all the zeros. And so whatever theory we come up with has to take both of these into account. And so, you know, as I said, repulsion of the low-lying zeros increased with increasing rank. It was present even for the rank zero. As the conductors increase, the repulsion decreases. And you know, it doesn't seem to matter how we're choosing things. So the question is, what model will describe this? What model will describe what's happening for finite conductors? And the answer, we believe, is the following. We're going to call it the excised orthogonal ensemble. And so the first part is an arithmetic part where we replace the conductor n with a new number called n effective to basically rescale which matrices we look at. The way you should view this is if you're looking at the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and you're comparing it to classical compact groups, you don't compare it at a height t on the critical line with the infinity scaling limit, you compare it with matrices of a given size. And you choose the size of the matrices so that the mean spacing between the zeros corresponds to the mean spacings between the eigenvalues. And so that first, that little arithmetic boost, that does a small amount but not a huge amount. The main part is that the values of elliptic curve L functions are discretized at the central point. And so if the value is below a certain amount, it has to be zero. The general philosophy is quantities related to L functions should be modeled by quantities related to uh, matrices from classical compact groups. So if you want to understand values of L functions, you should look at characteristic polynomials. And so what we've done is we've said, well, because the elliptic curve L function has to be discretized, if it's below a certain amount, it's got to be zero. Let's only look at matrices whose characteristic polynomial at one is at least a given size. And then anything that's smaller than that, we'll assume it's going to be collapsing down to zero. And we'll choose the collapsing so that the numerical percent that we're observing is matching up with the amount that's collapsed down. And so when we do that, you know, we start off with... You know, here's a histogram. It is a law that you must look at quadratic twists of E11. All elliptical curve experiments must start here. You see the following histogram for the zeros. You see a very bad fit just looking directly with random matrix theory. But when we put in our new and effective, when we adjust the size of our matrices, 
and when we put in the fact that we're now drawing the matrices not from SO even, but from excised SO even, we now get this you know, solid black line, and we get terrific agreement. It now you know, comes down and does a great job fitting. So again, this is not a proof that this is the correct model for elliptic curve L functions. You know, we're not going to be able to prove anything like that, but it's a very simple model with essentially just one or two key parameters, and it does a phenomenal job describing. Uh, work I'm doing right now with Nathan Ryan at Bucknell is try to look at the zeros above the central point for other families of L functions, you know, other weight k level n, where you still have discretization, but the discretization is not as much, and try to get a sense of how all this is related to the you know, values at the critical point, which I think is going to be the next key theory. So I think I have one minute left. I want to just end, hopefully I'm going to jump to the right slide, uh, with the following. So, one of the versions of the title I gave Tom was on saddle-tated lower-order terms. And so I talked earlier about how the first and second moments control what's going on. In the universality results that Rudnick Sonic had, it all was coming from the fact that the first and the second moments were the same, and that was why they got all this agreement with the uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble, these complex emission matrices. When we look at the first two moments of the families of elliptic curves, something strange seems to be happening. Uh, these are very special families of elliptic curves where I can actually calculate the sums. And you know, the A1, this is essentially related to the rank, it's negative R times P. Uh, in all these families, it's very, very nice. The second moments, you know, it's a little bit different if you're looking at the family of all elliptic curves. It's a little bit different if you're looking at families with complex multiplication, because half the time the coefficient is going to be zero, so you get like a doubling effect. But in general, for the second moment, the main term is going to be a P squared. And then what we observe is the secondary term always seems to be negative. And so Michel has a beautiful paper where he proves that it's going to be the main term is of size p, p squared, and then the error term is going to be of size p to the three halves. There's a cohomological interpretation. Uh, there is actually a family where you can prove there is a term of size p to the three halves. It was, um, I think it was this family over here. Now, this family over here, the coefficient here, uh, is this number over here, it's p times a, four, a, a coefficient of an elliptic curve with complex multiplication. On average, this coefficient will be zero. So even though this is a term of size p to the three halves, it averages out to zero. In every family we've looked at, the first term that survives, that is not washing away, always has a negative coefficient. You can actually use this, I'm not going to go into it now, to explain a little bit of the excess rank phenomenon. I can explain like 0 0.003, 0 0.03 of the excess rank by using this because it's giving you a small bias in the same direction. But what it's telling us is that when we're trying to understand what's going on, the low order terms of these family averages have a role to play. And the question is, what can we say about these averages? You know, so for specific families, I can actually calculate this, or even better, I can have my students and future students calculate stuff like this. Can we prove something in general that it's always going to be negative? And if so, you know, what are the consequences of this? So I have a bunch of references at the end, if anybody is interested. And because I know the organizer has to ask a question, I'm making it especially easy for Tom to have a question to ask me. So thank you. say because this is being recorded what I offered in exchange to keep the ring, but I will say I am still happily married and I still have my son. <laughs> Congrats. Um, are there any other questions apart from that for the speaker? So you mentioned earlier in your talk that you expect there to be a precise definition of what a family of function means. Yes. Can you speculate on what you expect it to look like? So I mean, right now the definitions we have are working definitions. We are, you know, family bell functions, we have some notion of a conductor, we have some kind of trace formula that allows us to compute the averages over the family. And so we need some kind of family bell functions that are linked together. And so in some sense, when I give you a strange condition such as twice the average of, you know, the first zero is twice the average spacing above the central point, there's no nice way to link that into an averaging formula, no nice way to bundle all those together. 